Coming up on the marketplace, traders in electrical products have had their shops raged down by unknown officials, prompting threats of demonstration by affected traders there. We shall hear from the Crown Mayor, who says he had no idea what exactly happened in the course of the day, together with the Guta president, who is calling for calm. Plus, we delve into the intricacies of the holy evil Kita base in Petroleum exploration activities as we will be joined by a social entrepreneur on the reasons why he believes this could not be in the interest of Voltarians. Plus, government sets to raise $5 billion eurobond this week after it settled on an expected interest rate to be paid on the funds today. We have all these stories and more coming up shortly after this break. Do stay. Hello and welcome. Now traders in electrical products have had their shops raised down by unknown officials, prompting threats of demonstrations. Now, the situation has seen the Accra mayor, as well as some officials of Guta, prompts a press conference to drive home their concerns. Let's now hear from the president of Guta, who was addressing traders in Tree, calling for calm. Hey, Adiano, say, we have said you see, we have and we have said we we have said that 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 we have Well, that was the president of Guta, and uh, to which what exactly he was stating is that the demolition exercise, they don't know exactly the authorities that you know, enforce this particular exercise. He feels the pain of these traders, he says, and that investigations are currently pending as he assures them to calm tempers as authorities of the Accra Metropolitan Assembly organize some investigations into what exactly happened. You can see the traders there as he was addressing them some, sometime this morning. But let's now bring in the Accra mayor, uh, Mohammed uh, Soa, who's also been speaking to these are great traders on some investigations and the call for peace in this particular moment. Many of you are here for a long time. And then I'm going to be here. 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 If you have a young coy name, now you have free table top, now you have a container more, it should be an agreement and an understanding. And that is a discussion I want us to continue. 
Well, that's their crime mayor that is stating that demolition would not happen to see traders have to move off their tabletops, not getting exactly where they should find the next meal of the day, and that investigations are currently pending and that traders would have to exercise restraint at this particular moment. We shall keep an eye on this development to give you updates as and when we do have them. But away from that, the National ID Card of Ghana, that is the Ghana Card number, will be the main form of identification for new business registration at the Registrar General's Department from April 1st. However, there will be a transitional arrangement over the next 30 days where it will still accept both the tax ID number and the Ghana card until it is phased out for May. According to a statement from the Registrar General, the move is in line with the recent announcement by the President that from April 1, the Ghana card number will be used as a tax identification number as well as a SNIT number, according to the Registrar General. Now, no new business registration form will be completed without the Ghana card number. So th that's just a bit of information there for those of us who are interested about the Ghana card identification system. You're still watching the marketplace. When we return from this short break, we shall have a discussion on the onshore exploration at the Kitab Basin, which has so far generated some controversy. Do stay. Hello and welcome back. Now, in 2018, the Environmental Protection Agency started a series of public hearings to, to clear misconceptions and receive feedback from various districts to be affected by some onshore exploration in the Volta region. Now, it follows illicit concerns and expectations from communities about the proposed 2D seismic survey by the Swiss African Oil Company in the Kita Delta block as the country prepares to venture into onshore exploration. We do know that minimum expenditure for the initial three years exploration period is about $48 million. Now, Swiss African Oil Company and that of Pet Volta Investment have been awarded a new exploration and production license for the Kita Delta block, located somewhere in the Volta region of Ghana. But the acquisition makes Swiss African Oil and Pet Volta the first to explore for oil onshore Ghana. But there are exceptions, there are perceptions, and even that of conspiracies and concerns by you know, both the residents there and even policymakers, opinion leaders. We're joined in the studio by social entrepreneur Vincent Jokoto, who has some exceptions to this particular agreement. Vincent, we're so grateful that you joined us. Someone could ask, I mean, why an exception to this innovation, they could term it, when indeed it is to prop up our oil reserves and, of course, ensure the betterment of the people that live in that society. Well, first and foremost, there hasn't been a sustained effort by our government to solicit the views of the constituents of Keta. Mm. First and foremost, I believe that around the oil discussion, both the citizenry and the government must have a clear plan and a clear path forward um, with resort to how the resources will trickle down to human capacity development too. Mm. That is the first socio issue with the problem. Then again, there is an economic consideration. According to Goldman Sachs, there is a transmission from fossil fuels um, to clean energy in terms of investment. And we're going to see some $16 trillion being spent over the next decade to attain that you know, um, transmission. And I believe that is, it, it, it's a pristine opportunity for us to actually look into other alternatives such as wind farms and solar farms. And so when you do look at the economic you know, impact of it with, within the global context, and you also look at the on the ground sort of reaction to what's going on. Mm. Clearly, there has to be a broader discussion around the oil exploration, how it would um, impact households, the domestic economy, and our republic as a whole. But of course, we're learning that close to $48 million is to be, you know, rigged in in terms of revenue margins from this exploration. And of course, when you talk about the matter of uh, having to transition from fossil fuels to renewables, there have been so much concern within that angle, but government keeps reiterating the fact that yes, we can transition to that of renewables, but the prospects regarding fossil fuels here in our context in Ghana is indisputable. Well, it's certainly going to take a while for us to actually now depend fully on renewable clean energy. Mm. And I believe that within that space, 
fossil fuels do have some significance. Uh, clearly, the Takara, this um, you know, case study is, is, a, is, is, is an example of, I guess, the impact that oil has had. There's still a very huge doubt mm -hmm. and there's a you know, wind of skepticism as to how is it near to our common benefit as a people. Um, you also want to consider the corporations that are investing in that sector. So yeah, Swiss um, Africa Oil Company is one of rep is, is a reputable one, but you have to look at the global trend and realize that BP, Total, Shell are all you know huge players within that industry and have indicated that they would also be moving away from you know the infrastructure that has preserved this sort of um, oil and gas economy mm -hmm. over the last half a century or so, and they are looking at you know cleaner alternatives because at the end of the day, um, climate change plays a huge role for the Keta constituency in particular. You're looking at the impact it has on fisher folk, on farmers. There are also huge concerns with respect to um, the displacement of people that live there. And last but not least, um, when you look at the security issues on the Ghana-Togo border, mm -hmm. West Africa as a whole has a huge problem when it comes to um, border security. We're losing $2.3 billion every single year from illicit um, you know, fishing um, on, on, on in, in West Africa. So clearly there's got to be enhanced maritime intelligence. We want to ensure that um, oil would not come with it some sort of political repercussion. So when you look at the entire ecosystem, right down from the households concerned, the domestic economy, fishing, agribusiness for that matter, and you also look at, you know, what's going on in terms of security, things aren't quite in place for us to welcome this development. Mm. Um, that there should be, you know, uh, I guess a revision um, as to the kind of agreement that we have in place now. I think there's uh, enough reason to buy time, consider credible alternatives, ensure that we don't, you know, we don't plunge the constituency into some kind of political instability as well. Um, so there has to be more cooperation between government stakeholders, um, you know, the free markets and also traditional authorities and, you know, political representation as, as well to kind of fine tune this whole um, exploration and ensure that it doesn't actually bite us back. All right. Let, let's, let's end on this note because we didn't know that the blueprint of you know, upstream exploration in Ghana is so positive. We take a look at Takra and what is happening there. We take a look at other areas as well, the kind of transformation that, you know, the oil giants have had in the various spaces that they operate. But then, of course, it begs the question of the environmental implication of which you've rightly stated. But there comes once again the argument that if we are protectionist of our resources and the potential of our resources being maximized to the best potential, then of course we're going to be where we were 50 years ago. The need for us to be innovative when it comes to policy making. What do you, how, how do you respond to this particular perception? Well, I do believe that it's a work in progress. Um, it's an uphill task nonetheless. Um, as I said, there is every need to reinvent our economy and clearly the direction in which the world is going, one, I guess, that is that resonates with most people that allows and preserves humanity for that matter right. with respect to climate change, um, calls for that shift to green energy. So it, it's, it has benefited us, or the oil and gas industry, in many ways. Um, but people feel that has been limited to, people, uh, to, to those with white color jobs mm -hmm. and it's been largely one that hasn't trickled down to the base you know, of our people and throughout the social ladder completely. Um, so we do want to have a clear plan as to what government intends to do you know, with the revenue um, for, from oil if it does intend to go ahead with that. Okay. Um, we want a clear idea of the impact it would have on the society and we should be able to weigh the balance and decide if it's something we should go ahead with. But if it's a question of cash, then that isn't one we have to worry about because clean energy is a viable alternative. Wind farms, wind farms is something that Ghana should look into. We could supply the continent for that matter. And, and so if it's about um, a substitute for this particular issue, then we're not lacking in ideas there. Okay, we could have this discussion. Too. Absolutely. I'm very grateful. We, we have set the pace and we shall be engaging you further for more discussions on this development regarding the onshore you know, exploration of oil at the Keta Basin. We're so grateful once again, Jokoto. Anytime. Vincent. Uh, he's sure. a social entrepreneur, giving us his take on this particular development. But away from that, the finance ministry is expected to raise about $5 billion in euro bond from investors this week. This will happen after it settles on the expected interest rate to be paid on the bonds today. But how is government planning to raise these funds and why is the cost seen as so crucial? George Rafi has more. Finance ministry is today expected to announce to investors 
partaking in the euro bond, the interest rate it is willing to pay on the funds borrowed. This could possibly lead to government raising the targeted $5 billion immediately after pricing of the euro bond. But we understand that the interest rate could be in the range of 7 to 9% based on current market conditions. However, the cost of raising the euro bond has been seen as very important because of its impact on the country's rising debt stock. We are hearing that the bond will be raised in tranches. The first will be four years, seven, 12, and 20 years. The four-year bond will be zero rated, meaning that there wouldn't be any interest or coupon payment made until the final year. Sources say even though government has secured the necessary commitment from investors in terms of the funds they want to raise, some are raising concerns about Ghana's revenue situation, especially looking at the country's rising debt stock and whether it could be able to raise the required revenue to finance these debts. Some of these investors are not comfortable about the fact that government is raising about $5 billion dollars with some thinking that $4 billion would be more appropriate because of its impact on the debt stock. Government is planning to use the amount raised to pay off maturing debts and finance some projects identified in the 2021 budget. The fundraising could go a long way to firmly stabilize the Ghana city because of its impact on the country's international reserves. Now, Ghanaian businessmen and women in the hospitality and tourism industry are hopeful of a boom in business in a few months following a seven-day tour of the country's tourist sites. Now, the familiarization tour, which includes strategic meetings with the country's tourism authorities, also saw setting up of a business-to-business -business interaction between Ghanaian businesses and Rwandan counterparts looking to penetrate the Ghanaian market on the back of the African Continental Free Trade Agreement area. My colleague, Gipti Andwap, Pia was there and now reports. Anne Rita Solana is currently a consultant working at the Labadi Beach Hotel. But as a former manager at the French Chamber of Commerce in Ghana, she's looking to broker some deals with G-Step Tours, a Rwandan touring company using its corporate social responsibility to produce coffee. I realized that coffee and tea are, you know, high on what Rwanda is, you know, known for. Ghanaians love also coffee and tea. And uh, we don't produce coffee and tea, we're very good in cocoa. And so we're talking about how could we potentially take this super coffee to Ghana. She wants the companies to take advantage of the African continental free trade area. Her counterpart at this business-to-business -business meeting is Andrew Gatera, founder of the touring company. He wants to enter the Ghanaian market with this coffee produced and processed by women. We are trying to see how we can cooperate in line of uh, exports and imports, uh, facilitating the locals here, and then uh, uh, to see how she can also link us with the market in uh, Accra, in Ghana, where she has her expertise. Rwanda's Trade and Industry Minister says since the operation of Rwanda Air in Ghana, visits from Ghana to Rwanda increased from about 950 to 3,535 within a short period. That's what the CEO of Sunseekers Tours Limited, Kwame Anson, and a counterpart with Sharama Event and Tours are discussing. Uh, Rwanda Air has flights connecting um, Accra to Kigali um, presently three times a week, but I think the post COVID is going to go up. So we're looking at how we can sell Accra and the rest of Ghana to Sharama. We can merge the market and be mutually beneficial for all potential clients and clients as well. Because it, it's really looking positive. You may want to stay tuned for that. But commercial vehicle owners and drivers have been given an opportunity to own a new saloon vehicle whilst expanding their transport business. This is by kind courtesy of the project driver whose investments are managed by Ecobank Development Corporation. Chief Executive of Project Drivers, Kwesi Owahini Achampon, tells Joy Business that his outfit's mission is to see the improvement of the transport sector. Project Drive is a... Um a better way at commercial transportation because the regular transportation business puts a lot of stress on investors, people who want to buy cars for drivers. You can want, you can want to buy a car for someone and you become the manager of the car, but you don't have any managerial skills to manage in a car. So what Project Driver was saying is, 
put your investments in the scheme. Let's get the cars for drivers who have gone through our process. And then we will manage the assets and the drivers. And you as an investor, all you're caring about is getting returns on your investment at the end of the month. Um, traditionally, you'd have to pay for a car worth 30000 20000 50000 But with Project Drive, with as little as 1005 you can be a car owner. You can be a part of a car owner. Uh, crowdfunding um, is a scheme where a lot of people can join resources together to finance a project. Whereas traditional businesses, individuals or sole proprietorships put all their resources into a venture and that comes with a lot of risk. I mean, business itself is, is risky. Um, so with crowdfunding, the financial risk on the part of investors is minimal. I mean, anyone can spend 1000 five or 5000 into the scheme. But if you have to spend 50000 or 30000 to buy a car, what if it goes up in flames? And then, if, I mean, insurance and everything, you know the stress it comes with. But we are taking it up because we've put up systems in place to manage all the stress that comes with managing assets like vehicles. There are a lot of people, especially the youth and um, the elderly. I've met a lot of taxi drivers who are old, they've grown up and when you look at their living conditions, it's bad. People are able to do taxi work, like drive Uber in America, and they're able to build in Ghana, build homes in Ghana. But I've not met any taxi driver in Ghana who is wealthy, <laughs> so to speak. So um, we're, we're hoping to build Project Drive to be that platform that the commercial driver or the youth who decides to go into commercial taxi work can use, can, can be proud of the fact that he can build a career out of being a taxi driver. Well, Executive Director of Financial Literacy for Africa, Dr. Richmond Frimpon, comes up next with our money love. Our budget highlight today on Money Lab is just drawing your attention to some great initiatives that will benefit you and your money. Cocoa farmers are supposed to look forward to getting their own pension. GPRT workers are equally supposed to look out for their own pension. If you work in any public space in the market and things like that, before, fire was one of the devastating problems that many people in those spaces had. You put your words, you put your things there, and the next moment is gone, and you don't have anywhere to go until governments come to your aid. Now, the budget is making provision for a policy that makes a mandatory fire insurance covering for all such public places. And so for you, the market woman, for you, the cocoa farmer, for you, the driver, public driver, look out for these benefits and insist that you get them. That is the benefit you are entitled to in this budget. I believe you took down some notes. That's how we end this edition of The Marketplace. My name is Charles Aite. For me and the rest of the team, many thanks for watching.